یهیو خیه ای سرا میا شنا و یسمیم شنا و شوا شنیم شنا ای خیه ای سرا و تماس سرا بکریا سر بهایی خبران بیارت که نان و یوا و افراهام لسپو لسرا و لیم کوسا Our weekly Torah portion today is called Chaye Sarah. It starts with Genesis 23, where it talks about the life of Sarah. Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. The chapter talks about the end of Sarah's life. And it follows the chapter which we discussed in our last Torah portion about the Akedah. Rabbis wondered, why did this happen? Why Sarah dies after the Akedat Yitzchak? And they come to conclusion that something really affected Sarah's life so that it ended right there. Agada, recorded in Midrash Tanhuma, talks about this. It talks about the Satan who took the appearance of Isaac and came and told Sarah about what happened on the Mount Moriah. Even though I, uh, I, it was the likeness of Isaac and Sarah saw Isaac alive, she could not take it. It was too much for her to bear. This shows how much anxiety Abraham and Isaac and Sarah went through when they had this experience of Akedah. This echoes an anxiety which will occur 2,000 years later at the Calvary. God wanted Abraham to experience what he felt when he actually died. Isaac lived through anxiety but survived. That was the difference. And that, even that experience affected Sarah's life permanently, and so she dies. Abraham faces a new kind of a dilemma. He needs to bury his wife in a land which, has, which doesn't belong to him. No single square inch of the land on which Abraham wanders for already many decades belong to Abraham. Yes, this is true. Abraham was welcome in the land of Canaan. His influence was positive. Even though his life was up and down cycle like everybody else's, he was human. Nevertheless, he was chosen by God and he was following God's will for him. And the will of God for him was to establish him as a forepost, as a beacon of truth to all nations that surround this world, this ancient Near Eastern world. And he came and he was serving this purpose by establishing altars and services to God. We read about this in Lech Lecha when he built the altar in Shechem and then he went down south and built the altar at Bethel. And of course, he lived in the oaks of uh, one of the Amorites by the name Mamre, and he had his altar there. So he was welcomed. People were allowing him and his big household with all his possessions, which was, of course, the flocks that were eating and grazing, and people well were allowing him to stay in. The question, of course, was, 
whether or not he can own the land there. This is a little bit different than the Western world. The Western world was built on the fact that the people were moving from overpopulated Europe into the no man's land, well, Indian land, but nevertheless, they had their homesteads. There was enough land for them to acquire and start farming it. The land of Canaan wasn't that much large of a territory. In fact, this hilly land was so overpopulated that everyone seemed to be living on the top of each other. So there was no free land just to take and use. Plus, there was another problem. The problem was that in ancient Near Eastern mentality, in Mesopotamia and particularly laws and in Hittite laws, sell of the land to someone who is not part of your clan is a taboo. Well, even in the Torah, this mentality is reflected. When somebody is getting poor to the point that he is bankrupt and he needs to sell his possession and his land to the slavery so he could pay his debts, next the king is obligated to purchase that land, to redeem his kinsmen. This was a very important concept. The land was not for sale, period. And Abraham needed it to bury his wife. And unusual thing happened. He comes to Ephron. In verse 10 it says, comes to Ephron, who was a Hittite. As we know, this land was a battleground between Egyptians and the Hittites. And in the 18th century BC, Hittites were more predominant while Egyptians tried to uh, creep into the land. That's why Egyptians were called the conquerors, the Plishtim in Hebrew, or the Philistians. While the Hittites sort of owned and colonized the land, that's why there were a number of Hittites who lived in this particular area. And so Abraham uh, entered into a negotiation with a man by the name Ephron, who actually sold to him a piece of land that became a burial ground for Abraham's family for many centuries. That was the destiny of Abraham. The promises which Abraham lived by faith. He received the promise that his posterity will be like a sand on a seashore and the only fulfillment of that posterity, of that promise, was through Isaac. He received the promise that he and his descendants will possess that land and the only possession of the land Abraham entered into was the possession of a small lot as a burial ground. That was all which Abraham received as a fulfillment of the promise, but he was confident that God will continue to follow through. And that was the basic anchoring faith that Abraham lived by. Faith which made him righteous man and a friend of God. Not his good deeds, not his righteous attitude or behavior which is always correct, which often in rabbinic interpretation uh, is often made a case that all what Abraham has done is always correct. 
That is not true. And we saw that. This is not always the case. <clears throat> but it still doesn't mean that Abraham is not a friend of God. He is a friend of God. But he is a friend of God because of his faith. And that's exactly what Paul is raising in his epistles to demonstrate that Abraham is a friend of God because he had relationship, because he had confidence with God, not because everything he did, God has approved. Unfortunately, that was the case at the end of the life of Abraham. The parasha ends on chapter 25 when Abraham takes another wife whose name was Keturah. Rabbis believe that Keturah was another name for Hagar. Agadic sources tell us that Abraham Although in the past uh, parasha we see the nasty separation between Abraham and Hagar, Abraham and Ishmael, because of the conflict over Sarah and Isaac, nevertheless, Abraham remained in love to Hagar. He was a decent man. Even though it was Sarah's idea, to, for Abraham to enter into the relations with Hagar, it wasn't just for Abraham a physical relations, as Rabbi believed. Abraham entered and became attached to this woman as a person. It shows the good traits of Abraham's character, and rabbis emphasize that. And he had many children, whom Keturah, possibly Hagar, bore him. But there is something happening here. Something happening, unusual. And again, something which is creating a problem in the future. It says here, now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. Sons of his concubines, that's the English translation. This is what the Hebrew says. Rashi, particularly the famous medieval Jewish commentator, uh, commentators of the Torah, notice that the plural in the word concubines doesn't actually mean that Abraham has a number of concubines. In fact, Rashi emphasizes that it talks about the sons of the concubines, referring to the many children uh, uh, whose names are here in, in verses uh, 2, 3, and 4, who had different status than Isaac. That's where the problem arises. The difference between the wife and a concubine in the ancient Near Eastern marriage law is very significant. The wife is the woman which you acquire from her father by paying the bride price. Bride price was a very important indicator of the status of the woman. Even though in ancient Near Eastern court, the woman did not have standing, but her man was her guardian. 
The guardian of unmarried girl was her father or her older brother. And the bride had to, bridegroom had to negotiate with the father of the bride, and the father of the bride would put a stringent condition and stipulation into the marriage contract. And we read about this. There is always thinking uh, that, uh, for example, polygamy wasn't a problem in the ancient Near East, and that's wrong. Yeah, it wasn't legally prohibited, but if you look at the marriage contracts, there are many stipulations against having a second wife for the man. The father of the bride was very protective to his uh, daughter. Concubine is a different story. Concubines come from the poor families where the daughters there were just like an extra mouth to feed. And the father of those girls just wanted to get rid of them uh, for anything. You know, a couple sheep was enough to create a transaction. And then this woman just had no status. Her children did not have the same inheritance rights. This is interesting how in the Torah, the uh, status of Keturah, possibly Hagar, is dubious. On the one hand, 25.1 says that uh, Keturah was his wife, Isha. But another talks about the Pelagat, the concubine. This could be explained because if Hagar was the Keturah, she was an Egyptian slave girl. There was no father for Abraham to negotiate the marriage contract with. This is why Abraham took Hagar, but without the marriage contract, she was considered a concubine. Legally, that was true. But what about ethically? Was Abraham ethical by sending his children from Keturah away with just a simple gifts? It's true, Rashi, in his commentary, says that these sons did not really hit the purpose. It could be, but could it have been the fault of the parents of not raising these children with the proper attitudes? There is a contrast here between the way how Abraham starts his life in Canaan and how many people he draws with himself from Haran who were not part of his family clan and these people accept the faith of God. Rabbis talk about this, about the Eliezer, who wasn't the relative of Abraham, who was just a simple Aramean from Damascus, but he accepted the faith of God, and he followed Abraham because he believed in the God of Abraham. Why the children of Abraham from Keturah did not follow the faith in the God of Abraham? Something is mysterious left out of the Torah text, but the consequences of these different treatments are visible later on. Midian, Zimran, all of these names are very well known, names of the enemies of the people of Israel. Could it be just a jealousy?
In fact, if we talk about the Midian, the Midianites were really bad to Israel for a couple occasions, but on the other hand, they knew about God of Abraham, particularly Jothra, the father-in-law of Moses, was a Midianite. So there was something here in the text left out, but <clears throat> we see that tension, a tension between which Abraham has between the legal context in which he's been raised, legal context of the family relations, family laws in the ancient Near East. And all the time where we see even Abraham taking Hagar and sleeping with her and having Ishmael, according to the ancient Near Eastern laws, there is no problem. But according to God's standards, the ethical standards, the spirit of the Torah, the principles behind it, we see that the consequences of Abraham uh, actions would transpire later on into a certain attitudes and relations between the children of Israel and the rest of Abrahamic children. This is why rabbis feel this tension. And this is why they selected 1 King chapter 1 as the haftarah that matches the Torah. It's a very, very difficult chapter, 1 Kings chapter 1, when David becomes the old in age, and his children, particularly Adoniah, becomes already, starts acting like his descendant on a throne. And we see another wife of David, Bathsheba, who comes in and tries to play her role of bringing Solomon into the throne. David was plagued with polygamous relations, and they haunted him until the end of his days. Even Bathsheba, whom he loved, did not stay with him at his, child, at his old age. And his servants had to take a young girl, Abishag, who would lay by him in the bed at the old age. And in uh, verse 15, it's just pathetic. It says here, but Sheba went into the king's bedroom, and now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was ministering to the king. We know how she was ministering. She was actually brought in to kind of lay by the side of David and just give him some warmth, warmth from her own body. But Sheba wasn't doing it. It was somebody else. And it looks a little bit uncomfortable. This is why we, this, this turned into a problem, a problem which had its consequences. That's why we chose the book of Hebrews as the counterpart for Torah and Haftarah reading for this week. Uh, particularly chapter 13, where Paul makes a certain ethical advices. In verse 4, it says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. The marriage bed being undefiled, the ethical principle which underlines the spirit of the Torah. In many cases, that's the important principle which is often missed by Abraham. It's true, Abraham acted by the law, 
of the Near Eastern times, and he did not break the letter of the law. But when God brings his ethical principle, there is a more involved. Behind just the case letter, there is a principle which involved there, which, if we follow, will have good consequences.